So right, my so my my background is uh, it's very diverse. Let's say so I started out as a biologist, did a PhD in bioinformatics, but in the meanwhile I've always been dabbling in doing citizen science, first on personal genomics data, and then more on the whole quantified self style of using wearables, uh, all the stuff there is. And now I'm based in Paris, at the Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity, doing research on how to better facilitate citizen science. That's now my full-time research job, which is really fun. And to just give an idea of like briefly of why this is interesting, if we just look at the different types of citizen science we see people doing, and think about the research cycle of what research actually should entail going from hypothesis all the way to drawing conclusions and updating your hypothesis. We see that citizen science these days very often, it's really just doing crowdfunding, asking people to give you money for doing your research or having people crowdsourcing the data collection or doing human computation. So our image recognition algorithms aren't good enough. So let's just throw lots of humans on it. So that we end up basically having an unpaid mechanical truck equivalent. That's the, the very negative way of viewing many of these citizen science projects. And what we are trying to do and doing research on is how can we come up with like really co-created community in citizen science where people are doing it from the start to the finish and are involved in all parts of doing it. And there are some really nice examples of this. There are the IGEM competitions where people are doing fun things with bacteria. And in the environmental monitoring world, the public lab is doing a really good job of doing this as well. But if one looks at the research of how many citizen science projects are actually co-created, it's less than 15%. The overwhelming majority, over half of them, are contributory. What's it, that's how it's called in the literature. And this means people are involved in collecting data nowhere else. So the question becomes for us is how can we enable co-creation and health and well-being related citizen science projects? And the, the lens that we are looking at it in Open Humans and also in my research is the idea of common space peer production, which is how to facilitate the production of, of things. And there are famous examples of this, and that's the open source movement in Wikipedia. And the hallmarks of this is that it's non-hierarchical. It's based on negotiated coordination between the participants. It's for benefit instead of for profit. It's based around modular small tasks and the idea of producers. So people produce things which can be reused by others in the larger ecosystem. And it's all very granular. So how can this now be translated into health-related citizen science? And the idea really for open humans and for our work is that we want to make use of all the personal data we are collecting. So there are wearables, genetic tests, social media, GPS logs, all of this. And the quantified self community is doing this really nicely on an N of one basis. So people have like their one off experiments, they collect their data and learn from them. But so far, it's really hard to translate this into group activities where we pull the data and can learn collectively instead of just one person learning and the other people have not really gained any new insights from this. And the framework we are using in Open Humans to approach this is of a centralized ecosystem for collecting these data and allowing individual and group reuse for it. So the first step really is that we allow people to import data from all around the web and it's based around open APIs. So People can import their wearable data, they can upload their genetic tests, they can upload their Google search history, their Google location history, they can connect their Twitter accounts, their GitHub accounts. And there is like a huge list of these things which have been built by the community and partially by us. So we have things like the Apple Health Kit integration, you can now upload your heart rate from your Apple Watch which was made by community members because it's open source and we have open APIs where you can connect the data to. Similarly, we have things like the, the Google search history where like another community member was like, oh, I know how to process the data so I can make the upload tool for this. And all of this allows people to store their personal data privately in open humans so that they can use it using a Jupyter Hub. And 
the idea really becomes to do self-research. And one of our former board members, Stephen Keating, who unfortunately passed away from a brain tumor last year, was a big proponent of doing self-research. We actually started the self-research memorial to honor his work where people are writing and sharing their insights of doing self-research with others. And Stephen, he was amazing. He found out basically because he he found out he had a brain tumor because he had like, a, I think it was a faint smell of vinegar. He was having like in his brain all the time. He was like, I smell this sense of vinegar, which is not there. And then he convinced people to get an MRI and they found a tumor. And then he was like so much into self-tracking, like his whole awake brain surgery. He had like, I don't know how many hours of video of like the whole thing of like how he's talking to the surgeons and everything and shared this data with others. He got 3D models and made even Christmas tree ornaments of his brain tumor. So he was very much in like the open sharing and learning from each other idea. And he even gave a TED talk about this where he, he reminds us that data self selfies, as he called it, don't need to be selfish. They can be there for a greater good if we can share the data with others and if we can use the, and use the learning collectively. And the way we are trying to enable this in the first step for the individual learning is by having our own little Jupyter Hub in Open Humans. So once you've connected all the data into Open Humans, you can make notebooks that fetch the data from your private data vault. And you can share those notebooks with others because they use standardized APIs. Other people can reuse the same notebook to analyze their data of the same kind. And I can actually give you like a small live demo of this right now, see how well that works. The, 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 the speech share works now, because I see some saying it's not working. If no one chimes in, I assume it does work. So, um... I'm seeing, I'm seeing well, your desktop. <laughs> someone said, is the screen being shared now? But if it's not working, try refresh. So I assume you can see the screen. I, I see me. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> so like, here's an example of one of the notebooks ah. and like, fitting the, the times we're living in. This is like a notebook which was productivity before and after the lockdown. And the notebook was shared while the confinement was ongoing. And if you want to run this on your own personal data, you have actually two ways of doing it. One is just like get a dashboard of it. So if you just press the open button, it will now run the whole notebook. It's using Vola, it's called. It's a library for Jupyter, which executes all of it. And it's basically giving you a dashboard. It strips away all of the, the uh, code cells, and it just renders the markdown and the output of the code cells. So even if people have no clue of how programming works in Python or R or anything, People still can use it as long as the data is in their open humans account. They can run this and get the dashboard at the end. And let's hope it actually gives the dashboard at the end. This is not just a demo thing. So it takes a while because now it's doing all the processing on the fly. So there's raw data stored in open humans, and it now renders the whole raw data after processing it. And we can see here is my activity before the confinement, how much I use the computer every week. So in January, I was on vacation. It's pretty low. And then once the confinement starts, it raises drastically. That's as we can see, because it's broken down by different kinds. It's because there's now a lot of virtual meetings and messaging happening, which otherwise would just be chats in the hallway or meeting in person. But now let's say that's fun. But actually, we know the confinement in Paris is over. We want to edit this notebook. So we can now press the Edit button. And now we get, just get a regular Jupyter notebook interface where we can make edits to the whole thing. So we can already start importing the data, load the libraries, and just add in here later on in the plotting. We can put in and say we know the confinement ended in Paris in mid of March. And now the whole thing runs again on my own data, but I could change the notebook and make it do whatever I'm interested in doing, making it to do. And now it doesn't work. Cool. <laughs> Interesting. Well, in principle, it should give the second repair. 
but for whatever reason, I think it's just filtering that. Ah, okay, I see it. it filters out data before the date. So we can do this again and do the whole thing, and we will get the updated graph that shows us how it's been developing since then. And the third thing is that now that I have made all these changes, I can easily re-upload this notebook for other people to reuse. So it's just a matter of going here and re-uploading it to Open Humans, and it will reappear on the website where people can reuse this notebook as well. So that's really nice to use for people who know to how to code, so they can make data analysis and they don't have to install any libraries locally or anything, but they can also share it with their friends or other people who have the same kind of data and are interested in similar questions. So that's the one thing. There's some more examples of notebook analysis that people have done. Here's one on how to analyze your productivity. So you can now also merge data from different sources. This uses the same productivity tracking data set in addition to the uh, step counts given from Fitbit or Apple Health. And you can see here's the correlation which is actually my data the year I wrote my PhD, where there were lots of hours spending a lot of time in front of the computer in those days. I didn't move at all. Or another thing that we launched recently is looking into heart rate variability and resting heart rate in relation to body temperature and when you're falling sick. And here's an example of this where you can see how basically the, the vertical lines are the dates on which people have fallen sick. And you can see that's the body temperature increase on the dates. And this actually launched a group experiment later on, which I will explain later in a bit more detail. But this, again, is all based on the individual not sharing any of the data. It's just about doing one-off analysis, but at least now they're reproducible. So unlike the typical quantified self thing where people write a blog post and they never release any code, here you can basically create a dashboard for others to reuse, and they can learn collectively and reuse things. The other thing is that we allow people to share data with individual projects, which can be either led by academics or they can be led completely by communities. And personally, I find the community-driven projects more interesting. And I have two examples that I want to share of this here. The first is Dana Lewis and her Open Artificial Pancreas System. So Dana has type 1 diabetes, and she has the problem that she needs to wake up in the night to figure out whether she actually needs to pump insulin or do any changes. Because there's this uh, thing that people with type 1 diabetes have a 50% lifetime risk of dying in their sleep. Because if you're asleep and things go wrong, you would just never wake up again. So she was, hmm, I have this continuous glucose monitor already that I'm wearing all the time. And it has an alarm, but because I, I sleep so deeply, I'm never woken up by it. So she just figured out that her continuous glucose monitor sends the data unencrypted via Bluetooth. And she just reverse engineered the protocol together with her partner and made a Raspberry Pi-based alarm, which just raises a louder alarm so that she could wake up. And then they were thinking, well, if we can already reverse engineer the Bluetooth and can get real-time access to our continuous glucose monitoring data, why don't we take it a step further? Because I also wear an insulin pump. If we can hook up the insulin pump to the Raspberry Pi, we can write an algorithm to automatically pump insulin whenever needed. And we don't have to manually intervent it, have to do any manual interventions any longer. And that's exactly what they did. So they created this open artificial pancreas thing, which is all open source. It's on the web. And I think around 300 people around the world have rebuilt this thing now. And they have the open artificial pancreas as well. So that's pretty cool. But now the idea is, how can we pull this data for actually doing research on this and how to improve our algorithms and learn more about our own disease? So they started pulling the data through Open Humans. So every individual that's running this thing is using an app called Night Scout. And they created an open source app, which you can just pop and deploy, which is the Night Scout data transfer, which stores the data in Open Humans. And there are each individual patients that patient that is running this thing can decide whether they want to share the data. And one thing the community of type 1 diabetes patients decided to do is build a data commons. So for people who just get real-time access to their data, they have the Night Scout data commons. If you have built the open artificial pancreas, there's an open artificial pancreas data commons where you can put the data in. And the people have come together as a community of patients decided, we want to run some experiments. And one experiment they're currently running is to see how a low-carb diet 
changes their their blood glucose and their insulin needs, which is especially interesting in the US where insulin is ridiculously expensive. And if you can minimize your insulin use, that's amazing. And of course, they can also now, because the data is stored individually in open humans, they can make new experiments and say, do you want to donate your data to this new experiment as well? So that's one patient community. Another really fun patient community we have is the, the cluster headache community, which is tragically undersourced by academic research. Like the cluster headaches are terrible. They are also called um, suicide headaches because patients end up killing themselves just to make those attacks stop. And it's around as common as uh, I think Parkinson's disease, but there's very little research being done into it and they get like a fraction of the research funds. So the patient community ended up building their own mobile app which is called the Nobism app for symptom tracking. So they track their symptoms, their interventions, and all of this. And they do it individually and privately if they want, but they can also export the data and again store it privately in open humans to then give other people access to their data. And one group they give access to the data to is a code academy. The Ubicom Code Academy has lots of data science students that are interested in using any data they can find for learning their data analysis skills. And now they actually have the chance to access real patient data to create data visualizations to not only for them to learn how to analyze data, but they feed back the data analysis they do to the patient community. So that's a very nice synergistic effect of where people get real world experience using real data and the patients that have no data analysis skills get back what they need to learn more about themselves. And in the same way that the data is reported back to open humans to the individuals, the individuals can decide to share the data with others. For example, to make a patient advocacy report that's based on actual patient reports to say, this is what patients are suffering and how our life needs to be improved. And of course, the group makes their own patient-led experiments. And that the, the little screenshot of the app here shows the uh, intake of magic mushrooms is no accident because the, the patients have figured out that microdosing mushrooms seems to work pretty well for individual patients. So now they're starting a group experiment to see whether microdosing magic mushrooms helps them to avoid having more cluster headache attacks and drastically increase their quality of life. And there are many of these projects that use data. As I said, some of them are academic. In the top row, we see Keeping Pace, which is run at NYU by Rumi Chanara, which uses wearable device data to see how the environment and seasonal patterns influence movement patterns in larger groups of people. We have some genetic projects, like the one below, the Genomics Genome Exploration, which is done at NYU and Wellesley, about figuring out how people can interact with their genetic data. And the last one that just started now during the pandemic that I want to highlight is the quantified flu. We've seen the, the graphs I showed earlier. And this came out actually out of the Open Humans community call. We were having just a discussion about whether our wearable devices might be useful during the pandemic. And then decided the community decided we would really like to make a group experiment out of this. So in a few weeks, we just code the word for it to see whether the wearables can be used for this. And now I think it's around 150 people who pool their wearable data and they report their symptoms every day so that we can actually not only get historic data, but we get ongoing data collections from this as well. And as I said, like lots of people are doing it. People have like the option to share their data publicly. I think around half of the people participating actually make their data publicly available. And you can browse this data. If you go to quantifiedflu.org, you can see for each person that shared their data publicly, you can see a heat map like this of like the symptoms they reported, how bad the symptoms were, the comments they gave. And one of the volunteers made the iPhone app for exporting the data. So it's really done by the community and we are just helping to facilitate it. And yeah, that's already all set. So last but not least for this all to work, it's like a matter of governance. So people put into open humans, it's privately stored and everything, but they need to trust us to actually like be good stewards of the ecosystem. So we need to build trust and community around this. And we have two different ways of achieving this. The first thing is how get new projects that want to request data access of individuals 
how are they ending up on the platform? While individuals still need to opt in into data sharing with each individual project that accesses or wants to access data, it's still a matter of like how trustworthy are they, how are they represented, and so on. And we basically do this by letting the community decide of which projects are listed on the website. So each project that wants to be listed needs to make on our discourse a forum thread and say, I want to ask to be approved and be publicly listed and invite people to participate in my study. Here's an example of the genetics of personality type project. It's done by an independent researcher that's part of the Roland Institute, and she has IRB approval for it and everything, so everything looks good. And the first person says, and so yeah, she gives more details about it as well and says what she wants to do. And in this case, she's interested in the Myers-Briggs type indicators and see whether there's any genetic correlations between the genomes of people and their Myers-Briggs type. So going forward, then people can approve or disapprove. And we see here within like a space of a single day, two very different opinions of people on this. The first person says, well, they have IRB approval. I don't see any red flags. And everything seems fine for me. While well, the second person says, well, the Myers-Briggs types are pretty much pop junk <laughs> psychology, and we shouldn't allow this being one of me ones because that's like ridiculous pseudoscience, basically. And the conversation lasted over, I would say, three, four weeks of people going back and forth on whether this is like a thing that should be allowed on open humans to run as a, as a research project. And in the end, I think that the consensus was that it's listed as a project now because it's as an ecosystem and as a platform, it's like how much do we want to have like a value judgment of the community of whether it's good science or not, if it's not making any harm. And here the consensus was like, even if you don't believe in the Myers-Briggs types, you think they will find nothing, having people say what their Myers-Briggs types is and sharing the genome will not lead to any harm for the participants, so it's fine to, to actually run it. The other thing that we are doing for building this trust and community is uh, the way Open Humans works. It's run by the Open Humans Foundation, which is a 5139, whatever it is, the nonprofit name in the US. So it has a board of directors. And the board of directors, usually it's just self-nomination of people again. And it's somehow the board that elects the new board members. So it's very self-referential. This is a very stark contrast how Open Humans elects its board or at least parts of it. So it's growing how many people are elected directly by the community. So if you just register and you have an account on Open Humans, once a year you are invited to actually elect some of the new board members once the board terms expire. And this year, actually, it's still outstanding because of the pandemic. We didn't get around to doing it yet. But so once people have like a clear head and can think of less things than the pandemic, then we will actually start sending out these things. And people can nominate themselves and say, I would like to become a board member and actually be responsible for running the organization that's actually hosting all of this and be basically the boss of the paid employees. And then everyone that's nominated, once that's done, like people get an email and say, you can now vote online for your board members. So that's pretty much the overview of what we are doing. So we allow people to import their data and make a per project decision of whether they want to share the data and how to share the data. And it's not limited to academics. And I think that's really important for doing citizen science that everyone can Basically, if they have a good idea of what they would like to do research on, and they can fill out the forms and say why people should share their data and how they will use the data, everyone can use it. And this basically only works because everyone can play an active role in the governance of the ecosystem itself. And yeah, I think that's the, the very brief overview. So we are a really nice little team of people working on this. We have lots of volunteers. We had some interns and have some interns working on it right now. The Quantified Self community has been really great. And yeah, I'm happy to field any questions. That was great, Bastian. And um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the paper and I'm seeing, you know, I didn't realize that uh, Tim Head, isn't Tim Head uh, um, with, uh, didn't he develop my binder? Or, right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this is just, uh, there's, there's, there's so many, 
so many great aspects of this project, but it seems, seems like one of those is that is also building, building real infrastructure tools um, that is really impressive. Um, so certainly I, I wanna ask a question for John, if I may, um, because yeah, like, like I joined the, the community call to, to you know, tell you about what, what we were hoping to do and and looking to get some some feedback and um you know if could you say a little bit about what has previous like you said that some some people had maybe thought about adding eeg to yeah to open humans uh, yeah. Oops, um yeah so we had thought about it but what kept us from doing it this was partially like that we did not know what kind of EG data would be interesting. Because I mean, I'm aware that like it really depends on whether it's resting state, what kind of tasks it is, and so on. So in principle, like what does it take to get EG streams into open humans? It's we have like a very standard OAuth to API. If you can authorize people somehow, then you can push data into their accounts. And the way it works is that by default, you don't get any personal information of the people who register. You get a random eight-digit identifier, so they you are not they are anonymous towards you, and you can just push data into their account without knowing who they are. Yeah. And at the same time, you can send people anonymous messages. So we you send it through Open Humans. We send an email, and they can anonymously respond to it. So you never need to get any personal information of them besides the one that you have collected through your implementation. So you can use this through basically whatever means. So it's very easy to have like. We have standard Python libraries which handle the whole authentication for you. So if you implement this in your own Python library or in your tasks, you can at the end deposit data into Open Humans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the, the very short answer. Technically, it's pretty easy to to implement the APIs. Sure. And and uh, Hans is asking where where does the data end up being stored? So we are storing it in uh, AWS S3. So it's sure. in the Amazon cloud and it's stored encrypted address there. OK. OK. That's and I see there's like one more question from Romain. So we have any connection with my data? Yes, actually, the uh, our executive director of the Open Humans Foundation is a board member of the My Data <laughs> Foundation as well. So <laughs> we are closely aligned with them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, where where would we find? I mean, so you know, I'm I'm asking questions for John just because it was it, it was kind of uh, it's kind of his project that I was talking about in terms of um, you know he's he's currently uh, wrangling all the the changes to GitHub's I mean to our um, EEG notebooks project on GitHub, which I I think I talked about at the community yeah. call. And um, uh, so, you know, because it was a super like kind of, you know, demo project for people interested in EEG, like it currently just, you know, writes out text files or, you know, doesn't, doesn't not doing anything, anything fancy. Um, do you have a GitHub that we can point to for the authentication for open humans and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can put the link in. Let me. That 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 would be, that would be really um, interesting because we're, you know, these were, these were some of the. Um, okay, so yeah, Kareen's asking. Um, so we also have like. Uh, let me put the link in first. So we also do have like a generic. Uh, generic uploader, which takes files and you can take like a data type to it. So if like your libraries already write standardized files, you could just ask people to upload it through the standardized file uploader and you wouldn't need to implement anything. Cool. So that's the, the very low tech solution which requires more user involvement. They need to be willing to go to another website and upload. Sure. But, and I think like that's the one thing, like the, the best way for handling the upload, if you run notebooks, the issue is like as it's OAuth, you somewhere need to be able to store the client ID and client secrets. So there's like mm -hmm. some, some mm -hmm. thinking to do about this, whether you can somehow make people upload it through the web browser in like a more secure way. Mm -hmm. But 
in principle, there's no reason why this would not be able, where we wouldn't be able to do this. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, I think the really low hanging fruit is just register a data type and say, this is EEG data of this kind, and people just upload it. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I love the fact that, you know, it, it's like so many of the devices that I would want collecting data in conjunction with the EEG, you, you've already got, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm super impressed by, I mean, you know, this is this is why I wanted to, to join that community call. Um, but I, I was expecting just information about the, the governance and, and things like that, not like you're already collecting so much data. Um, so Karina, I know, was asking um, just about what, what would you say is the difference between open humans and my data? So my data does not offer any infrastructure. My data is more of a lobbying interest group. So they're like a group of people coming together of like thinking about how can we use personal data responsibly, but they are not the ones implementing any infrastructure. They are a conference and an organization that's like, a, it's a community more than any technical things. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. And and yeah, we do work with them. As I okay, said. So, okay, yeah, you can read. <laughs> so so we, we have, like, the, our our executive director is on the board, like and like they gave like one of the keynotes I think at last year's My Data conference, and we are chatting with them. And, like many of the My Data folks are in our Slack and vice versa. So there's collaboration going on. Do you work with national data institutes? Um, well, so one collaboration we have, it's not a data institute, but we have like a project on autism, a citizen science project with the Alan Turing Institute in the UK. That's okay. the National Data Science Institute. Is, is that with Kirsty Whitaker? Yeah, it was called Kirsty. Okay. Okay. I think I so think yeah, that's so. I think that's how I actually heard about open humans. Uh, yeah, uh, so they are using open humans as the as the data backend for storing and handling the consent and everything. Awesome. And otherwise, um, we'll see. I will have like a call in front of the uh, National Cancer Institute and the US Data Science Fellows on Wednesday to see what we can do there. And <laughs> sure, sure. I mean that that that's also you know really interesting, just because the you know with with kind of like your your immune, you know, your immune system and and its its ability uh, to fight things is is you know we need we need so much more data about yeah. how things you know all the kind of measures that we can get to see how those are the the interplay of those. So I, I could see that being a great one. Um, I know John's asking more about IRBs and um, so. Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. So we have recently, like, we started a, another COVID-19 survey-based project actually in France at the Cree that got IRB approval, of, what is it called, CPP, CCP, whatever the acronym is in France to get ethics approval. We got one for using open humans as the data store and consenting awesome. like three weeks ago. And yeah. we have like a number of US-based studies that are running with Ethics board approval at US IRBs. Great. And well, so the one in the UK with Kirsty, we are waiting to hear back because actually we are in phase one of that project where we have IRB approval for doing the whole user testing and the the workshops for doing coll collaborative design work with people with autism. Yeah. And the data storage will be the next IRB approval <laughs> that we're awesome. going for. I think like so far we have not. So. The issues what, what, Neuro imaging. It's like completely text-based, so it's collecting uh, experiences. So we ask people to say whether they had good or bad experiences in their daily life as people with autism responding. Like today in the metro, it was terrible because it was so noisy. And how this is how I cope with it. So it's building a knowledge base and it's trying to then in the end to do some like natural language processing to figure mm. out whether they're mm. common allergies. So is it more like a diary? Yeah, it's more of a diary kind of thing. Sure, sure. I mean, you're not um, so. You know, again, I, I don't know if you're if you've heard of the Child Mind Institute uh, Healthy Brain Network, 
but they they were collect you know so one of the things that they did with at least a subsample of those kids is giving them um, like something like Fitbits and um, and a mobile app that that would randomly during the day ch you know chime and and then ask them to kind of check in emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, um, th this this doesn't sound like it's random. It, it's more. No, this is specifically, it's like, it's when people have like a very good or very bad experience. It's like uh, up to okay. them, it doesn't trigger. Okay, okay. So it's not designed to get like a random sample. It's very focused on getting like the impact, impactful events that people experience. Sure, sure, sure. But but super super interesting. And and uh, John, I'll, I'll definitely try and follow up with Kirsty. Um, uh, you know, so I know that that we're we're wondering what we should do in terms of trying to get IRB approval um, to collect data from from you know people and and then having the additional problem that that we don't know necessarily what country they're in. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, have have you you know how how do you manage that um, in terms of uh, do you just follow you know it. I've sometimes thought that uh, certainly in medical device development, we follow Europe because Europe's the strictest. <laughs> and then we feel like if we meet uh, Europe's criteria, then we meet everybody else's. <laughs> that's pretty much the same. Like it's open humans is like GDPR compliant. And uh, that's basically how we cover most of the things. That's why like we have like GDPR compliant in Europe. So I guess most other places in the world are fine too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, Roman's just uh, um, mentioning. Yeah, I know Ali Root. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Because uh, yeah, uh, Roman, I saw you had asked earlier about initiatives with community yeah. or students of Greece. So yeah, we do. So we just like had like the undergrads of the second year just finished an internship. They had like they have like work experience of researchers. So some of them, I currently have some other interns from Cree and we are trying to to get more things started. So definitely be in touch and we can figure out what to do. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Uh, I, I, I'd be and interested also, in... <laughs> yeah. And just to, to follow up on the mind logger thing. So let, that's been one thing on the roadmap for us is getting mind logger as like a data source in as well so that people can use their mind logger surveys that the child Mind institute develops and deposit the data in open humans as well to allow reuse of the data by other people as well awesome um yeah so i don't know what the digital science promo is but um if that's a, a, an initiative at cree but um so Cree is that uh, you said undergrads? Um, there's grad students too, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it has its own undergrad, master, and PhD programs. Oh, okay. Okay, that's awesome. Um, well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I want to. Um, so, what do you think will be? I mean, did uh, did you have a chance to to look at um, uh, or you know, you, like you said, you you were kind of familiar with Neurotech X before uh, uh, before I, I joined that call. Um, do you foresee any other issues that that maybe you know I wasn't talking about or um, that uh, that we should try and um, you know talk more about? No, I think it's, as I said, I think it's like at least in the first low hanging fruit, it's very easy to get started to get the data into the system. There's also like a, a ready made like Django web app you can deploy just for uploading files so you can style it yourself and it, like it goes into your own project and everything. Mm. And that's like, that minimizes the work as much as possible and you can get your own custom uploader. Mm. And otherwise, I guess the, the the question becomes a bit of like, how easy is it for people to record the data? So if it's like a Python library and people need to set up the, the libraries on there and 
I mean, ideally, what would be really great if there would be some way to connect your EEG headset to the Jupyter Hub in OpenHumans. And I have no idea whether there's a way to get it like connected to your browser. Well, I mean, certainly that's something that um, that Kyle Matheson or you know somebody uh, uh, involved with NeuroTechX, who's a professor at University of Alberta, has has done um, with his EEG EDU. So um, he he. He has that domain name um, where you can see what uh, what they've got implemented, and there's also a, a Slack channel in NeuroTechX that um, where he answers questions about it. But um, he he was using that to collect data from I think like a room full of like fifty students, uh, uh, you know, like a classroom, and. Um, yeah, so as John's saying, um, uh, we could definitely look into having a connection, you know, to the EEG notebooks, yeah. and uh, you know, I think I think that would be uh, an awesome use of of a Python developer's time if they're. Uh, so we'll 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 be looking into that for sure. Yeah, um, I, I think I remember that at least for the Muse, there was like a web Bluetooth low energy implementation where you could just use your your browser to connect to the muse and then use javascript to access the yeah. the signal right away in your browser yeah yeah i mean i i still you know i'd like to say that um that this is uh, you know a a pretty simple python install uh um, yeah. and and you know without necessarily going i mean we've we've definitely been looking at a particular fork of of EG notebooks that gives us access to a lot more headsets than just the Muse, yeah. and and um, you know that's that that would also help in terms of the number of people who could potentially be contributing data, um, but uh, but you know the amount of infrastructure that I see that's already there, and you know you're working with so many projects providing you know providing a service um that uh this is this is much more than we we had dreamed <laughs> uh uh and, and like you've been rolling you've, you've rolled this out for a long time and you know and i recognize people uh from my twitter stream uh that i thought of as as python you know like i thought of them as like computational python developers <laughs> uh not not also involved with with the kind of projects that we were you know absolutely trying to to kind of get started ourselves and you know this is this is terrific um so yeah, it's, a, it's a small world i know tim had through the mozilla like mozilla science program back in the day and this is how we got to know each other and then he was very instrumental in getting our whole jupiter hub set up up and running and like implementing the APIs and <laughs> sure sure yeah I, I I you know I I'm not sure I mean I've I follow Kirsty because she also works in you know kind of psychiatric neuroimaging and uh, uh, but I I'm also I wouldn't be surprised if I also heard about Open Humans at Mozfest or something yeah. um, and uh, you know uh, well great I mean. Um, I I want to dig into more details and and I hope we can we can talk again because um, uh, we would definitely love to find more overlap and and you know I think I I, I think I can speak for John saying like this is this is you know exactly the kind of thing that we've been we were hoping to you know asking questions yeah John's saying he's going to be in touch. Yeah. So um, we, we have our community calls every week on Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Paris time. So if people want to drop by, that's the very easy way to get in touch. And otherwise, <laughs> there's right. <laughs> otherwise, you can Slack as well. I can put the links into everything and then. Cool, cool. And um, yeah. Uh, I, I had a thought and it's it's gone, but um, uh, I will definitely be, you know, I, I'm going to be joining just to 
keep learning more about uh, about open humans. And um, so unless anybody else has got some specific questions for Bastian, really appreciated your time and um, and yeah, we, we will hopefully get something get something going. Uh, uh, like I said, like we've got, you know, a working implementation that's just not doing something very smart with the, yeah. So please, uh, I'm already in the, in an open human slack. Yeah. And, um, uh, we will be following up. Yeah, I have some, Great, looking forward to seeing all of you again. Yeah, I have, I have some, uh, just a, a short question. Um, yeah. You know, to, to that's very really great to empower citizens to participate to research and to help also like, uh, um, yeah, to, 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 to help researchers to benefit from contribution of citizens. Um, but it's for my experience, little experience in the field, um, it's never easy to make both sides to understand the constraint of the other side and to make them match. I mean, if we want the outcome of this to be recognized by the scientific com community as valuable, um, you need to reach some kind of criteria uh, in terms of how you conduct the research. Um, you know, how you um, make this not um, critical. Uh, I mean, if you want this to be accepted for this criteria, you, you need it to be, you know, from the data sources till the, the outcome of the research, you need to respect some kind of uh, rules or approach and, um, and not always easy to make. So, w w what do you do for that? I mean, do, um, you know, in some others, like, feel like a, you, you, as a CRE, you may also host some uh, other citizen science research. You, you may know about, um, um, you know, the ocean exploration uh, uh, project uh, uh, called, um, ah, I forgot, um, it's going to come back, but where they bring on the same boat. Uh, researchers and people are just like setting for uh, just because they enjoy it to make some to, to, to collect some data uh, directly from their ocean and they, they just do it together so that they both understand uh, because they understand the, the constraint of the others uh, and then when they come back it's not just like citizen collecting data but they conduct the first analysis together so that they better understand why they collect the data this way and so on. And uh, so I was just wondering how you manage this and um, yeah, and also how you bring that until uh, some valuable uh, research publication. So I fully agree, this is not easy. It's, it's a really hard problem and like our experience has been and that's part of the reason why we pivoted to more like the group research between citizens is that many academic researchers are not interested with in dealing with actual subjects at all. Like, why would we go and like try to engage people if we can just go and pay people for their participation and be done with it? It's like, in many, it's easier, it's faster. It's like, for many researchers, it definitely makes sense to go this way. And there's no hard feelings from my side. I understand why and can see that it has its own benefits, of course. But what we've seen, especially when it comes to the patient communities, is that they fill a gap by themselves, which academic researchers have not even started to look into. So coming back to the, the psychoactive mushrooms for the, the cluster headaches, for example, there is now clinical trials underway that are done by academic researchers in collaboration with patients, but only based on the preliminary data patients provided. So I think it's 
it's less of a competition of trying to do the same research as you would do without involving people more. It's trying to fill a gap or a different kind of research, which traditional academia, like if you are going to the NIH and try, tell them, I want to get some money to give psychedelic mushrooms to people, good luck getting research funding for this. But if you have preliminary data and you can say, here's like 30 patients who already have collected data, it might not be as rigorous as you would like it to see, but this is like a good starting point to do more rigorous traditional research. I think it fills this gap and it brings new ideas. It's like a way of generating more innovation than doing the same kind of research that you would do as the traditional academia. That's what it Okay, I understand, but if I take this example, um, you know, in academia, in the academic world, you will always have some people that will just like find some way to just, you know, criticize the way it has been done and tell like, you know, it's that no value because it doesn't respect this kind of criteria, this kind of rules and so on. So it's worth nothing. And then they will just like pick up the idea and run the research in a format that respects uh, the academia uh, uh, criteria and publish and get all the credit for it. Uh, that's why I'm just like wondering how we can bring this to the level of where it can be criticized and should be accepted by academia. You know? So yeah, that's, I mean, data quality is a huge topic in citizen science and it's, it's, unfortunately, it's one of the most published topics in the area of citizen science. It's, there's lots of research into this that shows that actually the data is co of comparable quality. So I think we are slowly, luckily getting a bit away from the, the quality concerns because there has been so many publishing being done on the question of whether this data is reliable enough or not. Mm -hmm. At the same I, I time, I mean, yeah, I'm not that much talking about the data quality, but more the way, I mean, you, you do like double blind, uh, you know, tests and uh, groups and, and everything that respect the way you conduct the, the, the research to, to get an uh, applicable uh, reason. Yeah, I think it, it depends a bit. So I have seen a couple of high profile publications coming out of patient and participant led research projects. I think the most famous example is what patients like me did. They made this huge study on ALS, which was like probably also less rigorous because it was based on people participating in the patients like me online forums. Mm. And they nevertheless got a pretty good nature medicine paper out of it. So I think it's definitely possible to, to get around this if you can address the, the issues that you mentioned. So, but of course, you will have a harder time because people have more more things to criticize you on. That's, that's the way it is. I think there's no way to deny this. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a good question. I, I think we should we should get, you know, we, we should see, I mean, we, we're trying to work out a, a, you know, a kind of statement of purpose with, with other parties and we should we'll get that out and for others to see and see what see what people think in terms of what we're proposing and and I mean you know for this specific project and and you know I do I did appreciate when you know at the community call uh, I forget the gentleman who who was you know was like you know, you're probably not going to get a lot of buy-in on this <laughs> and and uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I appreciated that you'd already heard of Neurotech X and you could speak to there being, you know, and, and open BCI as, as, you know, groups that, that have a community, but, but I think it's still, it's still a real question of, uh, um, you know, we, we want, um, we want this project to make sense to people and, and for it to be meaningful, I mean, to and impactful and, um, so let's let's work on the documents and and then meet again uh, um, to see what see what people think and uh, yeah but I mean I think we can learn a lot from from these existing open human projects um, you know I'm super uh, super impressed with the the diabetes uh, as well. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. so just to, to, to add on like the point a bit, I think like the one thing that citizen science projects get around many of the prisons just by the sheer numbers of people participating. So people might make fun of 23andMe for like how crappy the data is they provide and generate as much as they want. But then they can publish papers and saying we have genetic data of like 300,000 people, which no one else can provide. And it's like, well, even if yeah. their raw data might not be great, but just yeah. by the amount of people, and I assume that's very similar here. If you can get like 2,000 people to do the same recordings, but they are EGs at home, that's a sample size I assume not many people can easily reproduce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I um, and and they've made an impact. You know, I mean, as as, yeah. as one who's who's. Uh, I've used multiple multiple kits because they <laughs> keep changing, uh, keep updating, uh, um, and uh, you know I I was um, I don't know if you would know this, but uh, I, I'm super interested to know what happened to Ubiome, and and you know in particular uh, like does anybody still have their data? Um, you know, but you know incredibly important data that um, is is really hard to get <laughs> uh, uh, except from people who are pretty committed to you know to finding out what's going on with them uh, if they're going to you know send you samples of their poop um, but you know I, you know in psychiatry we're we're you know we're seeing more and more animal studies that are suggesting that this is a big missing hidden factor in, in, you know, arousal and, and, you know, emotional control and, and um, yeah. Any, anybody <laughs> that, that involves, you know, something more than a website. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for you, Bioma, I can tell you what happened was fraud, I think. Oh, was it really? Yeah, yeah. I think they they started selling their services as a medical service to insurance companies, and they double billed people and stuff like this. So, so they were actually, I think, mostly closed down by I think the FBI for wire fraud. That was at the end of the day how they closed down. But before they already failed because no one wanted to buy their product otherwise, they needed to resort to. <laughs> I see, I see. So they they kind of yeah. All right. Well, yeah, and, and I, I can witness that the service was not a very good quality because I did bought like a one hundred dollars uh, kit, and I got no results, never, <laughs> and I never get reimbursed. So, well, oh, hopefully, other reputable companies are stepping in, because uh, I mean, I would love to see you know those. It's one of those. Um, it's one of those measures that would be best with long time frames and and repeated repeated measures, you know, um, as well as collecting all sorts of other data, you know, because uh, um, again, like the the time scale is such that it's super hard for you to be able to say, uh, you know, how you were doing two weeks ago, right? Um, and this is the importance of that kind of quantified self, uh, uh, you know, stop, stop thinking that you've got this all in your head, <laughs> uh, and start collecting data. Right. Um, and I'll certainly, you know, credit, um, you know, um, some of the, you know, Mindstrong and, and other companies in psychiatry who who are emphasizing the you know the data collection that you can do with a phone you know even though it's it's not so specific it's like but it's it, there are measures right you know as opposed to relying on people's verbal self report and things like that and um yeah so yeah i i super impressed and um I'm not uh, seeing any more any more questions for Bastian. It's <laughs> the beginning of the day here. <laughs> um, 
Well, yeah. So, um, well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to learn more. I'll, I'll be a fly on the wall tomorrow's meeting <laughs> and, um, and see if I, I've been wearing, you know, I, I've known some people working at um, Fitbit and, and related companies. And they say something like if, if somebody can wear a device for more than five months, that there is that like there's a there's a drop off time uh, you know like you can't really say you've converted a, a customer until they've they've like gotten past five months or something like that I think um, how long have is the longest uh, or you know what what project has the kind of like the longest time frame that that Open Humans has been working with. Let's see. So I think that the diabetic community is a pretty old one, but I mean, then for like all the wearables, mm -hmm. we go back and import all the historic data. So, okay. Oh, so you can get that from the cloud services. Yeah. Right. So, so for example, like I've been using wearables for at least like eight, nine years, and so, like, all of the historic data, even if I connect it now, it will get it. And <laughs> okay. Okay. So we okay. have some people who have like data going back to 2010, I would say. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I need to I need to learn more about what um, well, I'm going to I'm going to go through the the list of of devices that you you already include. Um, <laughs> do, do you get um, what what good measures do you get of of heart rate variability, or what? Sorry, what devices give you good measures of heart rate variability? So I think that the Fitbit is pretty cool because you can get comparatively easily. It's a bit hacky because officially only their personal API gives you access to the intraday data, mm. but you can figure how to step by step guide how to create this endpoint and then pipe the data into Open Humans. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Good, good, good. So I see a question. So personally, personally the, the Ura ring is, I find, pretty nice because it's the only device I know that has a temperature sensor on board as well. So it reports for every day how your body temperature has changed. I mean, that that's, that's cool. And I know that there's this big UCSF uh, project with it. Yeah, and Roman, to answer the question, the quality and the exploitation on a long time, the improvement. So that's definitely one thing that's a bit problematic. So we just had on one of the last community calls, someone telling the story of how they just upgraded to the latest Fitbit model and like all the values are comparatively off to what they recorded before. <laughs> So yeah, the older the data is, the less accurate it's most likely to be, <laughs> I would say. Well, I I know that that is also true with some neuroimaging software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, 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 you know, you can't use the same, you can't change versions of FreeSurfer and get the same cortical thickness result. Um, but that doesn't mean that one's necessarily wrong. Um, uh, Gotcha. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm interested. Uh, I think I think John's got an aura now. I don't know if that's. If I, I'm just uh, getting that from his his video feed, but um, it, it, it does that also give you heart rate variability? The the aura ring. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a bit more limited because they only turn on the heart rate sensor during sleep to save battery. Ah. But at least, so you get like a very good reading during sleep that they seem to work pretty well. So you get like high accuracy recordings during the night, which gives you heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and five minute intervals mm. of heart rate during sleep. And from what I've seen, they made, they published together with like some researchers a paper saying that their sleep stage predictions are Compatible to like the ghost nerves, so that's awesome. 
Um, yeah. Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in using um, sleep EEG to, to answer kind of health, health questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, so don't see why, why uh, heart rate variability during sleep wouldn't be, wouldn't also be useful. Um, I know that's a, that's a big, big issue, certainly for um, men my age, um, in terms of predicting, uh, predicting health problems. <clears throat> um, is there, is there like an ECG group of, of, um, open humans? So not yet, but actually Gary, who at the call last week brought up the issue of not having buy-in. He is, I forgot the name of the device, but there is like a, I think, six lead home ECG device that you can use because he does it for looking into his, he had some issues, I forgot what exactly what it was, but he was actually having medical issues and was like, let me start tracking this. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. like, it's not wearable. You need to do it like multiple times per day or whenever you think there is something going on, but it's, it's good enough that he actually went to his cardiologist and could use the data and was like, yeah, we don't, you don't need to pay out of pocket for getting like an ECG at my practice. You can just like, use this thing at home for like a hundred bucks. <laughs> cool. Cool. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll ask him tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to... Okay. It's just going back to the, the issue of improving the sensors and the algorithms. That's like why also last week we talked a lot about having open source hardware for doing this. Yeah. That's the one, one issue that all of these companies have there on black box of how they turn the sensor signal into some actual physiological measurements. And it would be really nice if there was some open source way. And I know at the Cree, they are developing one of them. There's the Cree open band, which will be a heart rate and accelerometer device which the maker lab is producing and which now I think they are looking to start some first studies to actually validate the thing. Oh that's great. Yeah. Um so I'd love I'd love to get a link on that. I mean certainly, you know, what what we're trying to do here at Neurotech X is is um make make available as many many open platforms as possible. Um, for, you know, for all sorts of reasons, you know, um, but one of them being making it possible that to, you know, use your own data. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I get why a lot of consumer price point devices don't make their data available. Um, because that's that's also kind of like that's document you know it's features and documentation that they don't necessarily get any extra you know uh, money from uh, as opposed to being you know some sort of selfish uh, uh, yeah I mean you know it's it's not always them just trying to silo um, although that definitely happens too. Um, and I, I, I'm really interested to, to figure out how to be tracking all my Apple watch data. Um, just because I know that I don't, I certainly don't see any kind of interface like I can get with the, you know, kind of closed form Fitbit interface, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, so it's a great example of, of, yeah bypassing again not necessarily saying that apple has some great interest although i know that they are running i mean apple's got some uh some great partnership for for heart rate or heart health that i believe is connected with their their apple watch yeah yeah right they have the what is it called so they have health kit which is for the and consumer and they have research kit for actually my consent and giving right. people okay okay so so and, and do you know what the what the kind of legal issues are with research kit so is that something that we could use 
um, if we, you know, if we got approval, could we use that code and still keep the the data, you know, keep the data open? <laughs> So, I mean, you don't need to use research kit for this. There's also, you can make iPhone apps which re request access to the Apple Health thing in total. OK. So so what is what is the research kit for? So I think this somehow manages the informed consent process. That's at least my understanding. I see. I see. So it's more just giving you some of that um, Consent infrastructure to to say like this this person's definitely gone through this. Okay. Yeah, and so I I don't know what the current state is. I know that Stephen Friend used to be at Sage Bio Networks, was involved in getting this up and running together with John Wilbanks, who's still at Sage Bio Networks and now working on the All of Us. And okay. he's been working he's been working for many years on having like digital consent and how to manage it. So that's the whole All of Us mobile app. When you consent for it, and you need to watch the videos and answer the tests. That's all what he basically worked on. OK. Huh. Um, yeah. And, and where, so your background is bioinformatics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, are you are you involved? I, I saw I think Open Snip there, or as one of the yeah. What um, what are? I mean, if if we wanted to get um, genetic data from people who are contributing EEG, um, are there particular kits that um, make that uh, you know? make that the 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 easiest um you know do you do you, i saw 23 and me and as at least a, a a corporate icon um yeah so so 23 and me is i would say the one that's one of the cheapest and one of the easiest to enroll in so i mean so i mean yes i've been running open snip now for Eight nine years as well, okay. and I would and we have like I would say it's over two thirds of all the data in Open Snip of all the five thousand data sets. It's from twenty three me. So that's okay. like where you have the highest likelihood of people if they have done genetic testing and are interested in medical things at least. Then the highest likelihood is twenty three and me. The genetic genealogy groups like Ancestry and MyHeritage, I think they have more customers in principle. But at the same time, it's they are very, very focused on genealogy and nothing else. So I see. But I mean, they are chip is designed to do ancestry and health related things. So it's if you want to do research, it's more interesting as the 23andMe chip, I would say. I see. OK. OK. And that so so th there's a difference in, in terms of how how the the data is is actually processed. So or, I mean, all of them use these DNA microarrays where you have yeah. like between half a million and a million probes for known variants in the human genome. Yeah. And genealogy companies look at those that are informative for genealogy. They try to figure out where you are from, where your ancestors are from, and so on. So they have a specific set of these variants they are interested in. Huh. While 23 is interested in lots of genetic variants related to health and wellness, so they include all of those which the other companies don't. At the same time, it means they have less space on the same chip for genealogy, but huh. they made the trade-off to target both customer bases. Okay, well, that's 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 super relevant then, because you know certainly, uh, if if I was you know setting the specifications for for a project, uh, I'd want the health related, yeah. <laughs> I'd want the health related <laughs> genes. Um, okay, okay. At the same time, they do have a sizable overlap, and you can impute the missing bits to some extent. So I would say if people, if it's bring your own data and people already have like an ancestry data set, you can still make use of it. 
even if it's a bit less powerful than 23andMe. But if you recommend people to use one, then I would go for 23andMe. I see. No, no, no. I mean, that's that's great. That's that's relevant. And um, and you're integrated with their API already in terms of you can just click a button and. Uh, so they don't have an API. 23andMe oh. is very protective of their data. <laughs> Uh, okay, and so you have to download it and then upload it. You have to download and re-upload it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, it's it's a long story. I mean, like Twenty Three and Me, when we launched OpenSnip in two thousand and eleven, like we were contacted by people inside Twenty Three and Me from the tech side multiple times. Who said this is such a great idea, and they actually were working on an API, and we should allow people exporting the data to OpenSnip right away. And yeah. this would go like to two, three emails. Like going from like the developer to the like lower manager, middle manager, and then it would just die because they are we are actually making money of selling access to the data. Don't give the data away for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's I, I, kind of standard, but it's like, and it's fun. I mean, I have met uh, Envoy, Chiki, and Linda, every the two founders of 33 meet at multiple conferences, and it's it's always very awkward. Let's put it like this. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Um, well, I know, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I know that they've done, I mean, they've done a lot of presentations at, at Ancestry and Parkinson's, uh, it's Par Parkinson's is there, has yeah, been there. Parkinson's no focus? Have, like this big collaboration with the Michael J. Fox Foundation on right. that. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's really good to know. Um, uh I will try to find um I will try to find a gut microbiome kit that um that is is not not a fraud <laughs> situation and and could also um that we can also get data from C certainly again like um that that's one of the things that we've proposed previously for for psychiatric uh, research grant um It'd be really interesting data, and uh, yeah, at the same time, like as a biologist, I have to say this is the the worst data to work with. <laughs> like it, the variability is so huge that, like, depending on where from the fecal sample you actually take the swap, you get two different oh, results. Really? You really, yeah. So people actually made this with Ubiome, so they took like one sample from the one end of the fecal sample, one on the other end, send it them yep. both at the same time, same kit, and got completely different results. Really? Well, the, but isn't that... The variability inside the sample is so high. It's... But doesn't that, doesn't that mean that really you need to collect it all? Yeah, you need to somehow like take it all, mix it all to get like one... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can get around this, but at the same time, it's like so little is known at this point, at least, about the microbiome that there's like a lot of like things being promised which just don't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, that that that's super interesting and and definitely relevant to the you know again like we don't want to. It, it's also easy. You know, if you don't understand that that variability, it's still easy to find, you know, correlations between multiple, you know, data types, and you yeah. know. I have a very nice example of this actually, because like if like there's not enough bacteria in the sample, you will sequence the bacteria in the sequencing kit itself. <laughs> <laughs> and people published a very nice study of how like the I think I think it was like the the oral microbiome in newborn children changes over the first year of their life. And basically all they found because they, they bought new sequencing kits, of course, over the year. And it was just the different lot numbers which gave the signal of how it changed. <laughs> then people were like, let's actually like remove all the bacteria known to be contaminants and all the signal disappeared. The PCA, which was very nice group before clustered, was just like back to a single line of like no signal at all. <laughs> so it's it's really hard to do good microbiome sequencing. And I would say for uh, stay away for now. That's I guess my recommendation. Really? Okay. Okay. But um, I want to check in regularly about that because yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. 
Well, I don't, I don't want to bore people with, uh, with <laughs> stories of poop collection. Um, but, uh, I, I give anybody else a, a chance to ask Bastion more questions. And if not, let him continue on his evening. Um, I don't know if, if, if we're talking about a break, um, or we're talking about a, a, a future VR meeting. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> about uh, the, the association and the future of the, uh, our um, you know, taking stories uh, community. Cool. Yeah, the the there'll be a new um, there'll be a, a new video on YouTube pretty soon of of last Thursday's uh, hack night, where um, really nice VR um, VR and medicine presentation um, from Karuna Labs uh, doing um, doing you know, VR embodiment for for pain management. That was cool. And you know some discussions about improving that, um, improving the the embodiment feeling. Um, okay. Thanks again, Bastian. Yeah, and hope to see you all soon on the Slack, and that we can move move forward. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, there's a, a few things that I dropped into, um, cool, uh, that I dropped into the hack night, you know, cog, cog X is, is taking place right now.